All right, all right. Oh, we got one. All right, we'll work on that. Don't worry. My name's Daniel. I just want to welcome all of you here, and I'm very honored that uh, I get to welcome you today, but also, you know, they put my name on the stage, and, uh, you know, they, they don't do that for everybody, so I feel very honored and treasured and special today, so thank you for that. I hope you feel honored and special and treasured today while you're here with us. We're so glad that you're here in person. We're glad that you're with us online, and if you're a guest, I want to say especially we are welcoming you today and we hope that you do feel honored we hope you feel the the family love that we here have here at parkway we'd like to know more about you you can scan the qr code in front of you stop by the welcome desk we have a gift for you just for being here today and it doesn't matter if you're here for the first time or the hundred and first time we are so happy that all of you are here and right now we're going to stand up greet each other let somebody know that you're happy they're here
the songs this week and I just kept being reminded of God's faithfulness. Can anybody testify God has been faithful in your life? He's been faithful in your life this week. Our family can say God was faithful this week in our lives. And it's because He loves us. He loves us so much. And so sometimes we feel the love and sometimes we need to seek to see God remind me of how you feel about me. God remind me of how you love me. And so we go to his word and we see a verse we all know, John 3, 16, we could all say it together, but God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. We see Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were still sinners, not while we looked our best or acted our best or earned his favor, which we never could, but while we were sinners, he died for us. He loved us that much. Romans 8, 39 reminds us, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so what do we do? What do we do to thank him for loving us so much? Well, thankfully, God's word gives us this answer as well. And in Psalm 106, 1, it says, Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, because his love endures forever. 
And so maybe you haven't spent any time this morning thinking about meditating on his love for you. I pray you will. And I pray that you spend this next song praising him because of how much he loves you.
thank you for all that you do, Father, all the ways that you bless us, Father. We have sung about your faithfulness, Father, about your goodness today, Father. Father, as we go through the service, I pray that uh, we will just, again, be reminded of how good you are to us, Father. Not because we deserve it, Father, but you are a loving God. You're merciful. You're full of grace, Father. We thank you for all the ways that you bless us. Father, just be with us as we continue to worship you, Father. And I pray that you will receive all the glory and honor and praise. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Good morning, Parkway family. Happy Independence Weekend. I hope that you guys are uh, had a great time being off from work, but also celebrating the freedoms that our country offers. What began as a need to worship the Lord in freedom and truth became a movement which became a country. And from a country, it has become and morphed into all the freedoms that you and I enjoy and uh, Seems appropriate that we're in God's house today celebrating the freedom to worship on this Independence Weekend. We are grateful as a country to all those who sacrificed so that we could worship today without tyranny and without oppression, and we can worship the Lord as He is directing us to do that. Last week, we had a great celebration Sunday as we were closing up the All In series, and we had a great reveal that, you know, we had been talking about renovation and the needs and all the things that go with that, and um, we, had a, we had a great moment of celebration as we looked at the giving that God has asked us to do, and He laid it on our hearts, and that is always a sensitive subject to talk about giving because people are fine with it until you ask them to write a check or to, give, or to give something from the wallet. And I tell you, we were looking for 600,000. We gave a first fruit offering in one Sunday of $331,000 in one Sunday, right here laid at this table at the altar of the Lord. That was amazing. And then you add the pledges to it. We needed 600,000. We wound up with 800 plus thousand with, between giving and pledges for over the next couple of years. So now we have the green light to do everything that we want to do and then some more. So now we've backed up and we're looking at what else can we do or what can we take up to the next level as we look at what God is asking us to do in the future of our church. And it's exciting as we closed out the All In series. Today we're starting a brand new series where we're going through a book of the Old Testament. I'm not sure if you can tell what that book might be. There might be a hint somewhere. I don't know. Let's see if everybody see what book we're going to go through. We're going to go through the book of Daniel together. And the book of Daniel is an amazing story about people who were displaced from God and they're put into a foreign land and they're expected to stand firm for what God is asking them. God asked them to obey his ways, not the ways of the world. And for young people today, this book will be a challenge and encouragement to you as we follow the life of some young people who were put in a, in a difficult situation in a, in a country and a culture that does not love the Lord, is not following him, and they feel the constant pull for them to disobey God and to walk away from their faith and to go along with all the things of the world. And so that's where we're headed over the next few weeks. And I hope that you will, you will enjoy as we walk through the book of Daniel together over these next few weeks. Back in 1939, a movie came, hit the big screen that you all are familiar with. It's called The Wizard of Oz. Anybody love that movie? I do not love that movie. It terrified me as a kid. There are some scary scenes. It's a kid's movie, but there's flying monkeys and wicked witches. And there was a lot of things that just were disturbing to me. I remember when it would come on, I would get up and leave the room. Something about it just was very distasteful to me. It hit the big screen and it was very popular. It was based on a book series 
but the movie took some little turns. If you remember the story, it's Dorothy falls asleep at the beginning, and then a tornado picks up her house in Kansas and transports her to the fantasy world of Oz. And the, for the rest of the movie, like five hours worth, it really wasn't five hours, but it felt like it, right? It felt like one of the Avenger movies, right? Like three and a half hours of goodness, right? It was for like five hours, Dorothy is experiencing this fantasy world, and there's all kind of good versus evil. She's trying to help the three companions that she's with to better themselves. There's a big reveal at the end of, of the person that, that is controlling the whole country is not who they thought they were. And all of that goes on. And after three hours of this fantastical adventure, Dorothy wakes up and it was all a dream. Did you know that in the book series, it was not a dream, it was reality, but they ended the movie where she wakes up and it's all a dream. And maybe you would even say a nightmare. As we're gonna see in the book of Daniel, God's people are waking up in the middle of a nightmare of their life. There is something going on that God had been warning them about and warning them about. And in the book of Daniel, we're gonna see that that nightmare has become reality. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night with a disturbing dream and you look around the room and you realize, okay, that's not real. That didn't happen. It's not happening now, and you calm yourself in that moment to realize it was just a dream. For God's people, they woke up in the middle of a nightmare, and it wasn't a nightmare. It was reality. Their life is being turned upside down, and all the things that God had been foretelling and warning them about are now coming true, and Daniel and his friends are living in the midst of a nightmare. Before we jump into the book of Daniel, I need to tell you how they got to where they are. So you want to understand when Daniel is talking about living in Babylon, you'll understand why are they in Babylon? How did, I thought they were in Jerusalem. So real quick, probably not real quick, but I'll try. Let me give you a little historical background and how the book of Daniel came about. So that as we walk through it over these next few weeks, it will mean more to you. And perhaps it will go deeper and richer into your heart and your spirit than it ever has before. You remember that God's people entered into the promised land. We talked a lot about the Exodus and heading into the promised land. As they go into the promised land, they asked for a king and they got King Saul. And then after that, David came and David was a warrior king and he cleared the land of all the people who were not following the Lord. That was his command. This land is yours, clear it out and make it all one country. And so David, with great effort, had armies and battles to the north and battles to the south, and he secured a great nation of Israel. His son Solomon comes after him, and Solomon strengthens the country even more. With trade routes, they become very prosperous, and with political wisdom that God gave to Solomon, it now, now the country is not only physically strong with armies, it is wealthy, and it is politically strong. They are a world power in the world at that time. You had Egypt, you had Israel, and you had a couple other kingdoms to the north, and they were the most powerful countries in the world at that time. They enjoyed some of that prosperity for a while, and then their hearts began to wander away from God. They decided that they wanted to do things a little bit differently, and a civil war broke out, and this united kingdom of Israel actually breaks into two kingdoms like that you see on the map. Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Two completely separate countries. They get their own kings, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. They get their own worship centers, their own temples. And now they are completely different countries where united they were strong. Now they're divided, not quite as strong. Israel's heart begins to wander away from God. They start worshiping other gods, which is, remember the Ten Commandments, that's a big no-no. Worship the Lord your God only. And they start straying away from God. So God starts sending warning signs to them. He sends prophets to them to warn them, you need to stop, you need to change. Over and over again, prophets come to Israel and warn them, and they continue to ignore the prophets. So God does what God does. Eventually, God has had enough with this rebellion and when they are taking the name and the renown of God and they were lowering it and they were worshiping other gods with them. So much so that they would go to one God's temple and sacrifice to him. Then they would go over to Yahweh and sacrifice to Yahweh. Same day, back to back. And God said, that's enough. 
And so God sends the Assyrian people from the north as a warning. And Assyrians come and invade not once, not twice, but three times. And each time God's people would stop and they would repent and say, we're sorry, God, the circumstances are too much. We understand, we're gonna repent. And so they repent and God relents the first time and the second time. On the third time, God had really had enough and he did not relent. And the Assyrians came in and wiped out the country of Israel, gone. You hear about the country of Israel in the news right now, that's some of the same land that they were fighting over in that time. The Assyrians came in and Sennacherib and other kings came in and they had an army that came in and invaded and they took away and they destroyed the cities and all the things so that when they were done, Israel no longer existed and the Bible doesn't speak about it as a country anymore. Judah is now living independently as the Southern Kingdom and they're still worshiping the Lord and staying true. But as most people happens, their heart began to drift as well. And so God begins sending warning signs to them. He starts sending prophets to them, telling them they needed to change their ways. Does that sound familiar? Even in our culture today, our heart tends to drift away from God and people think that there's better times and when things are good, we don't need God. I've got money in the bank. I don't need him, right? I've got, you know, we're healthy in my family. We don't need God right now. And, and so they started to drift away from the things of God. He began to see, send other prophets. Some of these names you'll know. He sent Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And Jeremiah comes into the city of Jerusalem and is weeping on his knees, weeping, saying, if we don't change, all of this is gonna be gone. Everybody, the whole city of Jerusalem, they're like, you're crazy, old man. There's nothing gonna happen to this city. There's lots of people here. We're on a hill. We've got big walls and we're fortified. Nothing's gonna happen. And he continues to weep over God's judgment is coming if we do not change. Isaiah came in as the prophet. He is speaking truth to them, warning them again and again and again. You have to repent. You have to stop worshiping false gods. And again and again, Zephaniah is a prophet who came in. Habakkuk, all of these are giving warning signs to what God is saying is impending doom if you do not change. Ezekiel is charged by God to come and warn the people of that nation. Notice that he sees them walking away from God and the believers and followers of Yahweh are silent. And so God tells Ezekiel a special charge I wanna show you in his word. This is what God says to Ezekiel. It is a call to speak truth into a culture that is walking away from God. This is what he says to Ezekiel, his prophet. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word that I speak, give them warning from me. When I say to a wicked man, you will surely die. And if you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways in order to save his, wife, his life, that wicked man will die for his sin and I will hold you accountable for his blood. God says, Ezekiel, if you don't speak up and that person dies in their sin, you're responsible because you're supposed to be speaking truth. To the culture that's walking away, Ezekiel, you should be standing up and saying, don't do that, that's not what God says. And he said, if you tell them and they disobey, that's on them. But if you, a follower, a prophet of the Lord, if you refuse to stand up and you refuse to speak truth, then you, Ezekiel, will be guilty of their blood. Their blood will be on your hand. What a powerful statement to what we as God's people should do in a culture that is walking away from the Lord. Is it okay to be silent? Is it okay to just go along? Is it okay to just say, hey, I'm okay. I hate it for them, but you know, that's on them. It's their choice, but I'm choosing to follow the Lord. He said, Ezekiel, you have to stand up and you have to speak truth. And you know what Ezekiel did? He did stand up and he did some weird things to get people's attention. He shaved his head and his beard with a sword. Ouch, right? That's gotta be a little bit painful, right? There was no big disposable back then. With a sword, shaved his head, took the hair, made three piles, and on this pile, he burned it, saying that a third of the people of Jerusalem will die a third of them, he beat them with a sword saying they're gonna be put under submission of another king. And then a third of it, he threw it up in the air so the wind carried it and saying a third of us will be carried off to another land. He packed his suitcases 
He put a hole in a wall and started walking in and out with his suitcases, like luggage. He's walking all day long. He goes back and forth. And if anyone says, what are you doing, Ezekiel? They probably just stayed away from him, right? They said, what are you doing? He said, we're about to go on a trip. We're about to be taken from this city and the Babylonians are gonna take us and we're gonna go into exile and we're gonna be in another land because of our rebellion. God is coming over and over and over again to the people of Judah to give them a warning about what's to come. Do you think they listened? Do you think their hearts were hardened? Do you think they would say, oh, well, we saw what happened to Israel. Maybe we should, uh, maybe we should shape up a little bit. Maybe we should take some time and repent and to change our life. And maybe we should evaluate how we're being, uh, letting the world pull us away from the Lord and to worship other things besides him. And yet they did not. And so God's judgment comes upon Judah. And that's where the book of Daniel picks up. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Judah, uh, to the book of Daniel. And in my Bible, it's page 747. That's not gonna be that page in your Bible. Uh, it's, it's in the back, towards the back of the, of the Old Testament. You can go and find it there. We're gonna look at what it is that God is doing in the midst of all of these warnings. Daniel chapter one, we're gonna start with verse one. It says this. In the year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. That means a great battle happened. Besieged it. You circle the city of Jerusalem. No food or water can go in and out. And they did it for months. You cut off the food supply. Jerusalem had an underwater water source. They dug a tunnel a long ways underground to reach an underground spring. They were good with water. But if you cut off the food for months, think about what would happen. If you can't go to the grocery store for a week, what happens? Imagine two weeks at your house without going to the grocery store. Imagine a month without going to the grocery store. Might start getting a little thin, right? Might start having to scrounge around for something that you don't normally eat. But they would do this for months and even years at a time, starving out the people so that their defenses get con continually weak. So they were besieging Jerusalem. The Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, that's Nebuchadnezzar's hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God, and these he's carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia, and he put the treasure house of his God. They went into the temple, they took out things, they took them back to Babylon, things that were valuable to God's people. Let's keep going. The king ordered Alphanaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. These were young men without physical defect. They were handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the culture and the literature of the Babylonians. So this great battle is happening and, and Nebuchadnezzar come down with the Babylonians and they're attacking Israel. Did you know that Judah, did you know that they did this three different times? Just like with the Assyrians coming down, the Babylonians attack three different times. And this account is the second time when they come in and they conquer Jerusalem and other cities and they take things back to Babylon. That was kind of their MO. That's how they operated. They take the best of that country that they just defeated and they take them back. What does the war look like during that time? War was brutal and it was bloody and it was gruesome and there was no mercy. This is a picture that this is called a freeze of one of the, the battles that happened. It, it depicts the war that is going on, right? And uh, it's got these battle ramps and it's got these towers. And so, uh, you can't see the towers yet and the ramps, picture's not playing. All right, just imagine in your mind, this big tower. So the picture was depicting war and it shows the battle ramps going up and people are throwing things off like rocks and they're throwing off other things that can make them to, you know, to, to stop the attackers. They're throwing torches that are lit to try to set the towers on fire. And this huge battle is going on. The Assyrians are so brutal that they would take the opposing armies they would decapitate them and they would shoot body parts over the walls to scare the people who were inside Jerusalem. They take the farmers outside and they would do that, trying to cause disease and try to make them fearful. And so all of this is going on. And, uh, and this is where Daniel's story starts. 
they are starting, they have lost the battle, and everything is starting to go back to Babylon. So there are some books of the Bible that, that are going to tell us these stories, right? You've got Second Chronicles, you've got Second Kings, you've got Lamentations, you've got obviously the book of Daniel, and you've got other books that, that are going to tell us this. Uh, Obadiah, Lamentations, they're crying over, over Israel falling. And so you've got all of this happening, but there's a better account if you flip over to 2 Kings. There's another account. That's one of those books that parallels. And as we go through Daniel, you may want to read some of these 2 Kings at the same time. 2 Kings 24, starting with verse 10, says this. At that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. Same account. Nebuchadnezzar himself came to the city while his officers were besieging it. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, and his officials all surrendered to him. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiakim prisoner. And as the Lord declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal place and took away all the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. He carried into exile all of Jerusalem, all the officers and the fighting men and all the craftsmen and the artisan, a total of 10,000, only the poorest people of the land were left. So Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim captive to Babylon. And historical accounts say that he put a, a brass ring in his nose, the king, and put him on a chain and made him walk 500 miles from Babylon to Babylon from Jerusalem. The king, humiliated with his family, dr they drug him all the way back to Babylon. He also took from Jerusalem the king's mother, his wives, his officials, and the leading men of the land. And the king of Babylon deported to Babylon the entire force of 7,000 fighting men, strong and fit for war, and 1,000 craftsmen and artisan. He made Madaniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place, and he changed his name to Zedekiah. So he is taking them on a journey. Notice that it said that he took everything out of the temple. Why is that important for you to know today? Because if you take things out of God's temple that God wanted to be in his presence and you take them to another country and you put them in another temple to another God, that is saying their God is bigger than Yahweh. Their God is bigger and stronger because God's stuff is now their stuff. They took it without permission and nobody could stop them because they're more powerful. Their God wins Yahweh loses the renown and the glory of God in that moment was diminished. The renown and glory of Almighty God because of the rebellion of Judah and its people, the followers of Yahweh, because they allowed the, the rebellion in their heart, the renown and the glory of the Lord was diminished in that moment. And as long as those artifacts stayed there in a at the feet of another God, the insult that they were hurling upon their God, our God, was devastating. The world realized, oh goodness, Yahweh is dead. Yahweh is no more. He has no more influence. The temple gets torn down. Other people get deported for the third battle. And Israel and Judah are a remnant of what they used to do. And the renown and the glory of the Lord has been diminished on the face of the earth that he created. That's what happens when God's people rebel. That's what happens when God's people allow themselves to be pulled away by another world and another culture that says, go along and listen and do these other things that pull away from him. It doesn't just hurt me and it doesn't just hurt you. It is a pull away of God's glory where he is glorified in my life and in your life by our obedience. The opposite of that brings dishonor to his name. Does he deserve for us to dishonor his name by what we do and by how we live? And because we sit silent and let everyone else just be taken away 
the warnings were there and God's people were silent. And yet, and yet here we see God's judgment coming on them in the midst of God's judgment. I want you to see that, that God is still providing and there are still some young men who are willing to stand up for what's right in the midst of a whole country that's bowing down and a whole country that's saying, look, look, the temple's gone. We have no place to worship. God, if, if he was down there in Israel and Judah, we're not there anymore. We made the 500 mile trek. We're all the way up here in Babylon. We just need to get along and go along. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is changing. Why don't we, the 10,000 of us and more that were exiled all the way up to Babylon, we should just go along. Can you imagine the pull on their hearts? If you're the only one trying to stand up, the pull on your heart, if you're the only one that's, that's willing to be true to the Lord your God. And in this moment, the pull was just undeniably. So the first thing I want you to see in chapter one of Daniel is the world's pull and see how it pulls on to them. I know you're saying, we're just now starting points. We're not gonna get to the end, don't worry. We're, not, we're gonna stop part of the way through but I want you to see it's important that, that you understand that their old world was gone and all that they knew was gone and they've been planted and transplanted into a culture that does not appreciate the Lord, does not care about the things of God. There is no temple to Yahweh anywhere. There's a whole lot of temples to other gods, but Yahweh is not mentioned anywhere. The temple that they would go to for sacrifice and forgiveness gets torn down in the third invasion. And there's nothing there. There's nothing in, in Babylon for them to worship the Lord. There was no church service to go to. There was no songs to sing. There was no hymns. There was no praise choruses. There were no modern songs. There was nothing. Imagine going through your day, your life, absent of the Lord. No mention of him, no reading of his word, no worship of him, nothing. The isolation and the emptiness that would cause on your heart and on your life was sitting heavy on their hearts and on their life. And in the midst of living in Babylon for decades in a foreign land, worshiping a foreign God all around them is that pull of the world to just go along. Go back to the book of Daniel. I want you to see how this pull looks. I want you to see how it is starting to pull on them. They are in Babylon because they are, they're, they're, they take those who are, who are healthy, they take those who are smart and those who are intelligent and those who are craftsmen. Do you think you would have been taken? Am I calling your name yet, right? If you, if you, got, some, if you got some skills in something, they're gonna use it, right? If you're a soldier, they're gonna put you to work. And if you're not a soldier and you're a doctor, they're gonna let you be a doctor in Babylon. And if they're gonna let you, if you're an artist, they're gonna put you to work building temples for other God. They're going to use the people and the skills that they have for whatever to make Babylon stronger. Did you know that Hitler used that same strategy in World War II? When he would take over a country, he didn't just take over the country and leave them alone. He took the men of fighting age and made them soldiers for Germany. They didn't wanna do it. They didn't have a choice. He took those that were, that were good at building things, mechanics, and you go be mechanic for Germany. They took every factory and you stopped making furniture and now you started making weapons for the German war machine. When you took over a land, it made you stronger because you employed all those people into your service. And so Daniel finds himself in Babylon because he's one of those smart guys. He's one of those with a lot of potential. He and some other guys are there and they have the opportunity to be used by Nebuchadnezzar to make Babylon stronger. And there's the temptation. He is invited to come and be in the presence of the king. We're gonna pick up in verse five. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. What an honor that is to be invited to the palace of the king and to eat from his table. He must have something really important for you to do. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah. They were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. Watch this. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. 
To Hananiah, he called Shadrach. To Mishael, he, gave, he called him Meshach. And to Azariah, he called him Abednego. Why would they change the names of the men? When they took over the king and they appointed another king, they gave him the name Hezekiah. Hezekiah is a Hebrew name because he's going to stay in Israel. But for those who are being taken back to Babylon, a complete assimilation into the culture is what they're trying to do. And so the changing of their names means something. Do you know what your name means? My name is Matthew, which means gift of God. But if someone were to change my name to something else, then it would not mean that. My middle name is Grant. I have no idea what that means. Maybe I should look that up. Somebody should Google that for me and tell me at the end of the service. I don't know what the name Grant means, but I like the name Matthew. It means something, gift of God. They change their name to help them assimilate into the culture. When you start looking at the names of the, of the men, the name Daniel means God is my judge. But then you change his name to Belshazzar, the name Belshazzar means Baal protects his life. You go from God is my judge to Baal is my protector. Changing his allegiance from Yahweh to the Babylonian God. And Baal or Marduk was the chief God in Babylon. For Hananiah, that name means the Lord shows grace. But if you change your name to Shadrach, that means that you're under the command of Oku. Oku was the moon god of the Babylonian empire. So you're changing your name from God is, is the source of your grace. God is where your, your forgiveness comes from. And now you change your name to meaning you're under the command of Oku, the moon God. Michelle means who is like God, change his name just a little bit. You change it just a little bit to Meshach, which means who is like Oku. Who is like God Almighty, the greatest of, in, the, in the universe to who is who is greater than Oku because they think Oku is the greatest in the universe. And finally, Azaria means the Lord helps. The Lord is who I go to in my time of hell. Change his name to Abednego, which means servant of Nebo, who is the God of writing and literature. You see the shift that they're trying to do? You change their names so that they will assimilate into the culture. You change their name so that that pull will still come harder and harder to say, just go along. You're no longer the follower of Yahweh. Now you're the follower of Aku, or you're the follower of Nebo. That don't worry about what you used to do and what you heard and what your parents taught you and what you've experienced in your heart. This is a new thing. You're now in a new country doing new things. And because of that, you just need to go along. Can you, can you see the pull? that the Babylonian culture was pulling on them saying, don't worry about Yahweh anymore. It's a new day and it's a new thing. And if you call something by a different name, then maybe, just maybe, you'll just, you won't think about it as authoritative anymore. It's no longer about Yahweh is, it's now Nebo is or Oku is. And all over the country, the culture is telling them to bow down. The culture is telling them to don't go, you know, don't remember and don't honor what the Lord says. The king has plans for these young men. He's going to tell them, he's gonna give them tests and he's gonna say, I want you to eat the king's food so that you can be healthy. Another assimilation, ignore the dietary restrictions of Yahweh and I want you to do it this way and they have a choice to make and we'll pick up the story there next week. They'll tell them to worship a, a, a large statue and bow down to a false god. And if you refuse, then you'll go into a fiery furnace. And they'll tell them, if you refuse to pray to this god, then you'll go into a lion's den. And all these punishments are lined up for those who will not bow down, for those who stand up for what is right. And for you and I, the book of Daniel is history, but it is also our present. If I've lost you in the history, come back right here. You and I are living in a culture that does not honor the Lord anymore. We are living in a country that was founded on Christian principles that has forgotten that, and more and more we are walking away from that. 
And you can see it all over the television. You can see it in the culture. And we're gonna, they're, they're gonna rename some things and they're gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna give some symbols to it and they're gonna repackage it. But when it boils down to it, it is sin against God. And we, you and I, every day, we are experiencing that pull of the world to walk away from God. You feel it sometimes? Like you're the only one standing for truth. You feel like you're the only one that's looking towards God when everyone else is looking to everything else and you feel that pull in your heart just to be silent where God is telling his prophets to stand up and speak truth. We feel like that if we don't go along, if we're not silent, if we stand for truth, there might be punishment. We might lose our job. We might lose friendships. We might be labeled a rebel, insensitive, hate speech. That's what it's labeled today. Speaking truth labeled as hate. And it's not, it's in love saying, we are wandering away from the God, the God of our ancestors, the God of our past, even the God of our present. And in the midst of the pull of the world, we, we give in and we don't even realize it. We give up some things and we don't even realize it. And, and the ways of God don't mean as much to our hearts anymore. Young men from Judah had a choice to make. You can stand for what's right and it may be punishment. It might be death. You might be burned alive. You might be thrown into the lion's den. And yet they had a choice to make of how are they going to live even in the midst of a foreign land when everybody else is bowing down. That was their choice. What's yours? How are you and I going to respond in a world, in a culture, walking away from God. Are we gonna go along? Are we gonna bow down? Are we gonna stand up and speak truth in love for what God has called us to be? Don't let the world change your name. Don't let the world change your future and change your identity and tell you that you're part of something else now. You listen to the Lord your God and stay true to what he is asking of you today. Are you standing up or are you quiet? Have you given up some things that you know that God wants in your life? Have you let someone or something or a culture pull you away from him? The challenge of Daniel is to stand for what's right and to stand firm and let God use you to bring glory and renown to his name, to elevate, to elevate the glory of God in your life because of your obedience, to elevate in the presence of everyone else that God is most high in my life and I will not change that and there's nothing you can do to make me change that. He will be glorified in my life and in this world that he created because he is worthy of that and so much more, amen? He is worthy of that. And I don't wanna bow for a moment. And I'm sure if I take stock of my heart, I'll see moments when I tend to be pulled too. But today the call is to get back to what God has asked us to be, followers of Him, of Yahweh and Yahweh alone. No matter what you face, you're not alone. Even if you're in exile and it's hard and some of you are going through some exile and I know it's hard, but I wanna say stay true to the Lord because he will bring you through and he will bring glory to his name and he will use you to do it. Stand firm, stand for the Lord, stand for what's right because it makes a difference in my life, in your life, and in the lives of others around us, to his glory and his renown be lifted high. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that in these moments, I pray that you would help us. God, I pray that you would uh, speak to our hearts of the ways that we've drifted from you. I pray, Lord, for forgiveness and for second and third chances. I know, Lord, that eventually you will have enough of it and judgment will fall. And God, I pray in these moments that you give us another chance to 
God, we repent of the things in our lives that we've allowed to come in, things that are not of you, things that are displeasing to you, God. And I pray, Lord, that we would, we would turn from that. We would get that out of our lives and our hearts, that you would be faithful to forgive and restore and that we would honor you and glorify you in how we live and what we do. Father, in these few moments, may you speak and may we respond, standing for truth, standing for what's right, standing for you in our hearts, in every way, honoring you. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, amen. A time of reflection, a time of commitment, as we trust in God and him alone for what he has done. He is the one true God. He is the one that saves. He's the one that created you and sent his son Jesus into the world so that you could be forgiven. If you need to talk to someone about that, there's a staff down front that would love to pray with you about that. There's an altar that's open, or maybe we just celebrate our great God that no matter what you go through in life, he is the God that we trust. I'm gonna ask you to stand where you are and let's celebrate him today.
I give thanks today for men of God everywhere who will preach the word. And aren't you grateful that our pastor is bringing us repeatedly to the word? specifically Daniel, and as he's pointed out to us today, and by the way, and the, many of you are very familiar with Daniel, he's just begun to get this foundation laid, and we are going to be challenged, not only today, but week after week after week, and aren't you grateful, again, for our pastor, but for that our God, the one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will never fail. Lori also reminded us earlier that his love endures forever he does not fail and we're going to need that and we're going to need each other so let's be prayerful for each other every day but as we go uh, through this i mentioned praying for brother matt as he gets ready for preaching on sundays what about praying for our hearts and the preparation of them as we walk each day but then as we come here to worship and hear the word let's do that this week and help one another many of you are doing that through sunday school um, i would love to let you know a place that you can get involved in sunday school see me afterwards and by the way there's a great event coming up for ladies have y'all been looking at your bulletin today there's several things in there but the one about the ladies is for july 19th a game night apparently backed by popular demand. I think all of these are legal games. I'm pretty sure that they are. Seriously, you wanna get signed up for that and you wanna be a part. And what else do you wanna do? Invite somebody, come on. I know one of y'all were thinking of it. Ladies, bring somebody with you for that too. Hey folks, go and have a wonderful day faithfully serving Christ.